Hello, I'm Steve Taylor, and I'd like for you to join me in the Virginia Production Alliance. We're the state's leading film industry advocate. We also provide networking for those interested in film and filmmakers. Producers of Sister Radio were able to meet folks from the Virginia Film Office, directors and documentarians, and film fundraisers at our events. You should do the same. You can join us in Northern Virginia, Central Virginia, and Hampton Roads. Check us out on the web at virginiaproductionalliance.org. What's going on to every out, everybody out there in internet land? My name is Chioki Ianson, and I am the Director of Community Media for the VPM ICA Community Media Center. We are a very fancy, brand new place here in the back of the second floor gallery at the ICA. If you have not been to the ICA, I highly recommend it. Also, membership here is free, and everything here is free, including the stuff that we do here at the Community Media Center. Now, it is our goal at the center to help good stories be brought into the world. We are a production studio and workspace, and we also just work with anybody who has a story to tell. People like the Sister Radio production team. Uh, this is a, a group of producers, well, a producer, a director, some other fancy people who know a lot of things about film. And they're out here to tell a story as people who are working independently in media. They're not um, out here with massive institutional support. And they, but yet they have a story to tell that is um, resonant for everybody, for people not just in, in this country, but at least uh, one other. And we are gonna have an evening where you learn about what they're up to and maybe even what you can do to help. It is my pleasure to represent uh, Cameron Kidd from Sister Radio. Thanks, Chioki. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. This is so special. I'm, I'm Cameron Kidd. I'm the producer and co-creator of the Sister Radio documentary. And in just a few minutes, I'm going to tell you how I got into this project, a little bit about what it actually is, and my top three tips I've learned so far since I started producing on how to, how to produce a documentary. Um, so I'm just really happy to be here in this amazing space that you all need to come see for yourselves. This community media center really overlaps well with the whole mission of Sister Radio, which is supporting women's voices on the air, especially black women's voices on the air, and lowering those barriers to entry. So if you have a podcast you want to record or a voiceover you want to record, you want to interview up to three people, you can actually make an appointment on their website. Go to icavcu.org. Yes. Make an appointment and come check this place out because it's sitting here ready for you to use for free. And I think that's just so awesome. So. The story of the Sister Radio documentary is it's about two young black female journalists starting their very first radio shows on independent stations that are 5,000 miles apart. One, Atari Gems, who's in Richmond, started her show called Black Minds Matter about mental health in the black community. And uh, Masitan Koulibaly in Segu, which is Richmond's sister city in Mali in West Africa, started working on Radio Socorro and started covering things like uh, FGM, female genital mutilation, the plight of rural women, and we follow how their lives change um, and how they become more confident in themselves through their work with the radio. And it's so funny, like just right before we got on the air, I, Andy and I were looking at Masi Tan, who is now a live TV reporter in Bamako, and saw her sitting behind the desk and we were squealing, like it's so cool to see that story. So the way that Andy and I got into it is in May 2018, we were both, um, volunteers, producers at WIR, which is just up the street on um, Broad Street. And um, the head of the Radio Socorro station from Segu was visiting. He was on like a trip visiting from the sister cities. He came in to see WIR and he was really impressed by the parody, the representation. And he talked about how his own daughter, Lala, had just turned 18 and said, I, I don't really want to vote because I don't think my voice matters. And that shocked him. That really scared him, and it made him think, I really need to work on this. I need to get women's voices on the air. And he had ownership of this independent platform, and he said, he talked to the president of WIR at the time, Carol Olson, and said, can I, I would love to have somebody kind of help create a platform and a program and film what the story is. So he asked for this. And when Andy and I heard that story, we were, <laughs> we were hooked. Like, we were in immediately, because we knew firsthand how important it is to hear yourself on the radio and what, 
an impact that has on your sense of self. So we, we were completely bought in on it. And um, I'll be honest, at that time, I had very little production experience. You know, producing, before that, I had done five short films that I had directed. And I produced most of those, and that mostly amounted to going to Costco and buying food <laughs> and like <laughs> texting people. But producing a full feature length documentary involves a lot more than Costco. Um, it involves what I would consider the two main aspects are organization and funding. I hope that's about right, Andy um, Edmonds. Uh, but that, that luckily our Andy, the director, Andy Arches, is extremely organized. So we're able to work together and she scheduled a lot of the shoots, which is kind of where producers come in, right? Making sure that you have access to all the materials you need and that everything is set up. But for documentary, producing is hard because getting money is hard. And if you've done any research, if you're interested in documentary film, you've probably already heard this. Um, getting funds is a challenge. I mean, even, even people like Ken Burns find it hard to get funding. And he's been around for a while and done a lot of great work. Um, so I'm going to give you my top three tips of what I've learned. We know we're only two thirds of the way through. We're a little bit past that. We still have to edit the entire film, so it is not done. Um, it'll probably be a whole year, maybe more, before we're actually complete. Uh, but the three things I've learned are find mentors who have actually done the thing, create events for your community that your audience actually wants to participate in, and the piggy bank. We'll get to the piggy bank in a minute. So <laughs> finding mentors who actually do the thing. I want to credit Virginia Berthelet from VCU for giving us this tip. She said, you really need people on your team who've actually made and finished a feature-length documentary and done good work. Because up until then, we had had mostly people from nonprofits and people who have kind of experienced the connection between sister cities and people from the radio station. But we were able to actually, through networking, find people who have done full feature-length documentaries here in Richmond and interview them. Um, you saw the little ad from Steve Taylor, the VPA, that, that man is amazing, and introduced us to everybody. So we put ourselves out there, we went to some events, and Steve was able to introduce us to Tyler Trumbo and Lance and Hannah Ayers, and I just sent them an email saying, I'd like to learn more about your work, can I do an informational interview? And they came to the radio station, and I asked them about themselves, you know, tell me about what you do, tell me about how you've gotten things done, and luckily they've been there for us you know, for questions. You also need people like that who can give you input and make sure that the work you're doing is good. <laughs> that you're on the right track, right? You need people who, kind of like a teacher in the room. I mean, even as recently as a few weeks ago, we emailed Lance and said, please help us, what size uh, hard drive do we need? You know, you need people who can help you with those kinds of things. Um, but I, one, my biggest tip for that, finding mentors, is actually a podcast. Whether it's actually a podcast, or a blog, whether you're writing for an, uh, you know, an organization or a publication, interviewing somebody and giving them a platform where they're talking about their work is a really good way to connect with people because they're more likely to open up and give back to you if you offer to do something that supports them first. And also it's a really great, you know, kind of sneaky way to get to know people, right? To, to lower that barrier. Sometimes an informational interview can feel really formal. So that's my, my big tip is find people who've done the thing and get them to be your friend. Number two is make sure that the events that you're doing and the way that you're building your community actually, actually relates to what your audience wants. You know, it's easy to fall into the trap, I'll admit this, I fell into the trap of just kind of putting out what I would want and I'm not necessarily our entire target audience. So you gotta interview your target audience. Who do, who do you wanna watch this film? Who do you want to be in your community to support you and say what do you actually wanna do? And offer them something of value instead of just saying please give me money. <laughs> You know, because everybody has a project that they need support for. So when we started, Andy and I put together events where we were doing live music. You know, we did stuff at Gallery 5. We did a um, spoken word event at a brewery. But it's, it's something that I think is really continuously hard. I hope something like this where we're sharing knowledge about how we're doing this might be helpful to our audience as well. Okay, number three. This is the painful one, kids. This one hurts. The piggy bank. This is the big lesson. If you're going to make a feature length documentary, you have to have some money set aside. Whether it's your money, a uh, producer's money, somebody who's agreed to give you this money, you need at least $10,000 in the bank before you can expect to really get funding in, in a serious way. And that's just because of the nature of documentaries. Um, you know, we, we do pitch decks, but 
to know what your story really is requires you to do a lot of shooting. And Andy will talk about that in just a minute. You know, you need to do a lot of work to get your story even together so that people can look at it and say, oh, I see what this is. Okay, you know, we need it. I mean, I'm not saying you need a piggy bank that's like like Squid Game level, but you do need a piggy bank with money in it. And and unfortunately, it's gonna be like probably more than ten thousand dollars that you need before you can start expecting to get funds. And that's really scary. Um, that's really stressful. But it's it's like it's a, one of the biggest lessons I've learned is you need seed money, and this is how the pros do it. You know, long into the distance, they take the money that they've made from other films and they put it down into the first third, two thirds of their project so they can show it off. So obviously we need to finish this film and we would really love support from you to help us get there. Hopefully telling you more about it will encourage you to go to our website, sisterradio.co, and there's a big PayPal donate button right there to help us get to the finishing line with the story that I think really needs to be heard and, and shared with our community. Um, so, top three tips from producing three years in. One, uh, make sure that uh, you have people on board who have done the thing. Two, make sure the community events you're doing are fit for the audience that they want to actually do. And three, make sure you got that money on hand. So, uh, that's it for Perils of Producing, but we have a whole night of wonderful events, including live music uh, from Amber Seven and a little bit of information from the director of the Virginia Film Office. But first, a different director I'd like to introduce, uh, Andy Arches, who is the director of Sister Radio. Come on up. Hello. Hi, um, hello everyone, and thank you for coming to our ICA event. Uh, my name is Andy Arches, and I am the director of Sister Radio Documentary. Uh, for me to be able to talk about Sister Radio, I'd like to introduce myself and how I got involved. Um, I immigrated to the U.S. when I was 15 years old with my own preconceived notions based on American TV, Hollywood movies, and American news that I watch while still living in the Philippines. And this is what I was told that America is a beautiful place where personal freedom and success is easier attained than anywhere else, where everyone has an equal opportunity to have a good life, where anyone can create their own destiny. All you need to do is to work hard, work smart, and you will be rewarded fairly. If you do not have a good life in America, you must not be working hard enough. Moving to America and meeting community members, especially through WRIR, helped me expand my understanding that whatever I thought I knew was wrong. WRAR is an all-volunteer run independent radio station here in Richmond. I first got involved when I attended their first women in audio workshop back in 2017, summer of 2017. This workshop was held at the radio station and was completely free. Uh, that's where I also met our producer, Cameron Kitt, who has also been volunteering for WRAR since 2014. The Women in Audio Workshop taught their attendees how to use field recording kits uh, and edit with programs like Adobe Edition to construct audio stories for the radio. After that workshop, I became a regular at WRIR where anyone could come and learn about radio production. This time taught me everything I needed to know about the basics of radio production. In 2017, Atari Jams and Tanisha White, two college students, wanted to start a radio show about mental health in the black community. WRIR asked me to, uh, to be their producer, and by March 2018, the Black Minds Matter Project was on the air. The Black Minds Matter Project was a passion project for Tanisha, Atari, and her colleagues. They saw how the extrajudicial killings of Trayvon Martin and Alton Sterling affected their community and their friends' collective mental health. Through this platform, they cultivated conversations about the different ways systemic racism has impacted the mental health of so many in the black community. They asked vital questions like, what's it like to live in a community where most young men are expected to be incarcerated? How does this affect their families? What's it like to live in an urban food desert? What are the different community programs out there that are addressing these issues? These are the stories that we don't usually hear in the media. And after volunteering as a radio producer, I learned firsthand how important it is how we, the community, should be covering these issues. Why us? Why the community? There is a disconnect between our personal experiences and our representation in the media. 
And yet the media is where we get our facts and information, which affects how we navigate our realities. This is, there is an inherent bias that the media has when they push certain stories forward at the expense of the vulnerable that have affected how we interact and see the world. When I learned about America through the media was wrong. I did not understand the context of the American experience until I met people in, from different walks of life here. So as someone who didn't grow up here, I first, uh, firsthand noticed the difference between the world that is being portrayed in the media and the real American experience. In my case, this is what sparked my passion with photography and now filmmaking, so I can show my Filipino peers what America truly looks like. And as a Filipino, I also see that my Filipino community is underrepresented, even as the second largest Asian immigrant population here in America. My uncle has called us a silent majority. We learn to keep quiet, not to rustle any feathers, as a way to survive in this country. So again, I will ask the question, why is it important to cover marginalized voices by the community? There are many groups in our community who are most impacted by laws and policies that are being placed today, such as how zoning ordinances affect healthy food access on food deserts in the city. For us to understand how well these policies are working, it is important for us to understand how they truly affect our community members. Without access to healthy food, how does current zoning affect the mental health of communities and food deserts? We have to rely on independent radio journalism, community members who live in these communities, and independent radio stations like WRIR to cover these issues truthfully, without any corporate insight. We cannot rely on corporate media to cover these issues truthfully, as they will have and skew these stories depending on their interests. We see this through how the two biggest news channels have reported the same incidents but through different angles that cater to their followers. Journalism should be about the truth, and the truth comes from stats, data, and community voices. By including the truthful representation of marginalized voices to the conversation table in the media, through comprehension and in understanding, we will, better, we will be better equipped to find better solutions that benefit all of us. With this in mind comes the idea of the sister radio program and the Sister Radio Program will be an exchange program between sister cities, Richmond and Segu Mali in West Africa. It's meant to provide education to community members from marginalized backgrounds on different aspects of radio production, from hosting to editing to broadcasting. The idea for this was conceived in May 2018, as Cameron Kitt mentioned, when Mustaf Mega, the president of Radio Socorro, uh, came to visit WRIR. Uh, during Mustaf's visit, he was astounded by the amount of women volunteering at WRIR and has envisioned a similar future for ra Radio Socorro. He expressed the importance of uplifting women's voices in Segu by sharing his personal story about Lala, um, his 18-year-old daughter who just turned 18, and he asked, him, he asked her to register to vote, and she responded that her voice doesn't even matter, so why bother? We saw the silence again when Masitan, a Segovian journalist, interviewed her female family members in her family courtyard about their thoughts, their own thoughts on women excision. The women were hesitant to speak up when the mic was passed around. So for Mustaf, this educational program will help women in Segu, like his daughter, to find their voice, be comfortable with their own voice, and use their voice to represent their own stories and struggles in the media. We have a long and ambitious road ahead of us to get this program going, and we're going to need a lot of help to get the Sister Radio program started. That's why we're producing this documentary. Uh, Sister Radio, again, like as Cameron said, it's a bicontinental film that follows two radio journalists, both from uh, the sister cities, Richmond, Virginia, and Segu, Mali. And um, our our goal is to accurately portray how challenging but worthwhile it is to sustain a radio show hosted by independent journalists for their community. And de despite being oceans apart, these two remarkable women share similar struggles in their profession and media representation for their communities. Since May 2018, Cam and I have worked tirelessly moving forward with this documentary with no salary. We had day jobs though. Um, and in February 2019, Cameron, our co-creator, Erica Pomerantz, 
and I traveled to Segu with the help of Virginia Friends of Mali and with the help of donations from friends and family. But as you may know, film production is a very expensive venture. Right now we have documented 32 scenes in Richmond and 34 scenes in Segu, Mali. And we accomplished this with little funding, but we did not do this alone. With the help of our friends and volunteers, who dedicated hours and hours worth of work for free, from research to professional advice, to giving us their time and personal space for interviews, to camera work, audio work, graphic design, transcript, post-production work, setting up meetings. We are helped by many people in our community who believe in the mission of this project. This is my favorite aspect of this documentary. It is made by the community for the community. And let me take this opportunity to thank everyone who has been a part of this project. Um, organizations such as Virginia Friends of Mali, who's our guide with our Malian story and helped bridge us to fellow sisters in radio and in mission in Segu. Virginia Production Alliance is our resource for professional help in the film industry in our city. Virginia Humanities for granting us financial help this year. ICA for helping us set up and hosting this event at their new community media center. WRAR and VCU's film department for providing volunteer help, locations, and film equipment. Our main journalists, Atari Gems and Masitan Kulibali, for opening their intimate part, intimate part of their lives for this documentary. The journalists and community members who have given us their time and shared their thoughts in this documentary, the filmmakers and producers that guided us in the process, and all of our friends and volunteers who helped with filming, marketing, and tedious post-production work. The different artists who have shared our art for their cause. Erica Pomerans, our co-creator, who is the fountain of source of wisdom and who continually helping us develop the Malian story of our film. Our executive producer, Richard Bozard, who helped keep this project moving in times of struggle, especially during COVID. And last but not least, Cameron Kitt, who has been my partner in crime, whose relentless energy has kept this project moving forward. We've been through and done a lot. So thank you for keeping on tracking and doing all the hard work that you do. There is a lot of work, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. From finishing our transcript work, to editing, to creating stories from 100 hours worth of footage that we've accumulated. Many of our friends and families have worked for free, but it is very hard to accomplish this documentary without your help. And we'd like to be able to support everyone that has been helping us with the right value that they deserve to survive, especially at the age of COVID. Your support to finish this film will mean so much to us. Join us as we spread the importance of truthfully covering marginalized voices in the media. And I would like to end this presentation by sharing you a Tagalog word, kapwa. Kapwa is a word often used when talking about communities, but you will usually hear it as kapwa tao, meaning fellow human beings. But Kapwa has a different weight. And let me explain that by paraphrasing two professors of Filipino psychology, Dr. Virgilio Enriquez and Dr. Katrin de Guia. Kapwa is a Tagalog term widely used as a recognition of a shared identity, an inner self shared with others. This implies such inclusiveness is a moral obligation to treat one another as equal fellow human beings. It reflects a viewpoint that beholds the essential humanity recognizable in everyone, therefore linking people, including people, rather than separating or excluding them from each other. If we can do this, we are on the way to practicing peace. Thank you for your time, thank you for your support, and we appreciate you coming into this event. Up next, we're going to play the Sister Radio trailer, and then later, Andy Edmonds from Virginia Film Office will be speaking, and much later, We'll be hearing from our Segovian journalist, Masitan Kulibuli. Atari Gems, our Richmond journalist, couldn't make it tonight, but we, we look forward to having her at the next event. Please enjoy the rest of our program and have a great night. Bon, moi je dirais les femmes au sein d'une radio, nous pouvons prendre un thème qui nous concerne directement. est un droit. Être en relation avec les autres est un droit. Savoir ce qui se passe dans son pays et au-delà des frontières de ces pays est un droit de, duquel les femmes ne doivent pas du tout être privées.
there's important to have independent radio stations covering communities because the content creators are in the community each day. I want to raise my babies in a city that is actually safe. That's right. And so I'm going to be out in these streets until that city exists. That's right. There's not black feminists speaking about the realities of black folks in our city anywhere else here. Just because black people are, are serving in media doesn't mean that they aren't representing capitalist power structures. And so it can be very hard to be a black femi fem voice in politics and speak your truth, but it's what's necessary. Because the media is where our stories are told. And so if things are happening in the streets, such as the police brutalizing us after the cameras are gone, those stories are not told. In actuality, it's, it's us, it's people that we live with, people that we love, people that we work with, and just our neighbors and friends, and just having an honest dialogue about it. Au foyer et puis euh, étant dans le secteur du journalisme, c'est vraiment quelque chose de très très difficile parce que dans, dans le métier du journalisme, ça demande beaucoup 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 de courage. Money shows up when people decide they want it to show up, but when black people are saying we have to have the money to survive, it's all of a sudden just not there, and instead we might as well just fund the same people that are keeping y'all silent, because you're actually making too much noise for us and it's convenient and uncomfortable. Les femmes aiment la joie parce que chez nous ici, dans notre tradition, on dit, oh les femmes et les guintas. Guintas, ça veut dire joie fêtée. Tout doit se passer à travers ça. Des joies et des peines, tout y passe. Informing the population is always a good step to move forward. If I want to really take this journalism um, seriously, I have to get better at the recording. Testing, testing, one, two, one, two. Testing, testing, one, two, one, two. So I hope that gave you a little taste of what the story actually is. And Andy, what a great interview or discussion you gave. I just want to let everyone know at the very end of this, we have time for a very short Q&A. Um, so three or four questions. If you have a question for Andy about the documentary, about how we're doing it, about anything, just write the words A-N-D-E-E -E, and then write out your question in the comments of the YouTube that you're watching this on. And we will pick some to read out at the very end of uh, this live stream event. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce another Andy, Andy Edmonds. He's the director of the Virginia Film Office. We're very lucky to have support from them, and he's going to talk to you about how to make something impossible happen, how documentaries can change the world, and, and the role that documentary has played in Richmond. So Andy, thanks for being here. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you, other Andy. More about you guys in a minute. Thank you, ICA, VCU, this amazing community production hub here. I love this. Come here, tell a story, you know, make your own podcast. It's really awesome. You could do it for free. Is that right? I can't believe that. What an asset for the community. Okay, so our audience out there, you already know this, but making a movie is kind of like disaster management sometimes, right? Anything can go wrong at any given time. And that's just with a feature film or a narrative story in a TV show and that's with something that you have a script for. You have guardrails on it. You know what you're going to make, right? You just get the money, you do a budget, and you move forward with the manufacturing of these scenes that will fit into that script. But why I have mad respect for documentary filmmakers in particular is that they stand at the edge of a cliff. They have an idea what's at the bottom, but they're willing to kind of leap with a leap of faith towards a story that they don't know how it's going to end. And as, as an audience member, we reap the benefit of seeing the toil and work that that filmmaker has gone through to deliver this final result that's inspiring, of course. But in fact, in the beginning, you could start out the process of a documentary film and think that you're going to be delivering one message and you end up delivering a completely different message that's even more inspirational than what you originally intended. And that's the magic of documentary filmmaking and why I'm such a fan of documentary filmmaking is that 
the magic comes from the passion you put into it, and you just never know what you're going to end up with. And this is why I have such respect for documentary filmmakers. And this is why we, as a culture, as a society, as a community, need to support documentary filmmakers. Because at the end of the day, the documentary filmmaker does this work, not necessarily for profit, right? You know, we hope that it will make money. But the process is not about the profit. That's not the real market value of a great documentary film. The real market value is really measured in empathy, right? Because empathy is the true commodity that will allow us as a society, as a culture, as a nation, as the world, to really break down walls, break down barriers, uh, understand other points of view, so we can work together, you know? Documentary film is an empathy machine. So we need to all reach down and help Cameron and help director Andy figure out how to finish this film. I know the Virginia Film Office, we're gonna reach down and, and help them out as well. And then we're all gonna have a great premiere at the Bird Theater here in Richmond, right? And we're gonna celebrate this. And we're gonna bring our friends from uh, across the water here to celebrate with us. And we're gonna have an amazing simulcast with music live from the bird and live from Africa and just going to be an amazing opera. I can just see it now because I know you guys have the passion to do that. So I just want to say that the film office is here to support filmmakers, whether you're doing a large production with 150 people on the crew or a smaller production. We help people at all levels of filmmaking because we're passionate about filmmaking in Virginia. We have an amazing palette to tell any kind of story, right? It, any kind of story you can tell. We have we can do anything in Virginia, except maybe deserts. It's hard to do deserts in Virginia, but we can do any other architecture. Uh, I like to say that Richmond, it's interesting, is the northernmost city with southern architecture and the southernmost city with northern architecture. So you can do Boston, you can do New Orleans, you can do DC, you can do New York, you can do anything right here in Richmond in particular. It's an amazing palette. This is why filmmakers love to come here. So whatever you're doing, reach out to the film office. We're ready to help. But I can tell you that I've been inspired more than even the big projects we've done here. I know you guys have heard about them and, and, and what we've done with the biggest filmmakers in the world, from Steven Spielberg to Terrence Malick to Clint Eastwood and whomever. I'm inspired by amazing documentary film myself. And I'm going to tell you a little story about one that we filmed here a couple of years ago. It's called 16 Bars. A uh, filmmaker came into town, and they went into Richmond City Jail. And they wanted to do a story and try to audition and find some singers, some storytellers that could do a recording session in the jail, right? They had a recording studio in the jail. It was very unique uh, nationwide to have this recording studio. So they brought hip-hop artist Speech up from Georgia, and he produced the film and produced the music. And they found four amazing singers so the, like the first four they auditioned were just off the hook, incredible songwriters, storytellers, and musicians. And they recorded their tunes. And of course, they were speaking music from their heart about their life's condition. And, and one of them was a country artist. One was a hip hop artist. It was amazing. And they didn't know what they were going to end up with, but they captured the magic on film. It's called 16 Bars. Look it up, check it out, amazing film, filmed in, in Richmond City Jail. And uh, it's just an example of what can just be brought forth from having the passion in your production kit to tell the story. So I just encourage anyone that's out there that's uh, unsure of whether you want to take the leap and to try to get into this business or try to tell your story, everybody has a story. But you cannot just let, uh, you know, don't let money hold you back. I know it does take some money to do it, but you can start with anything. If you have a good story, you have a story to tell, even with this thing, this phone in your pocket, it's amazing the technology that's available, that you can start to tell a story. And if, you, if it's compelling enough, it will find the people that will help you complete it. It will find the people that want to hear it. It will find the people who will be inspired by it. So... We're here at the film office to help you. Thank you to our partners at the VPA as well. And thank you for the support of our industry. And especially thank you, Cameron and Andy, for the work you're doing. I can't wait to see the finished product and to celebrate it together. Thank you so much. Take care. Thanks, Andy. That was really kind and cool. All right, see ya. <laughs> this is live. Like, this is really happening right now. Um, wow. Yeah.
making magic happen and inspiring people. We're gonna show you some more clips and also a live freestyle from local rapper Amber Seven. You can find her on Instagram, Amber Seven as in the number, E-A-V-E-N, yes. Um, and so that, that freestyle is gonna be about radio and women, so stick around for that. At the very end, we're gonna have the Q&A with Andy. So if you have a question for her about the documentary, about filming, what it's like directing, what camera she uses, literally anything. Just write her name before your comment in the comment section below. Um, but first, we're gonna hear from Masi Tan with a really short clip um, in French, uh, her third language, about why she thinks being on the radio is important for women. Le concept genre, voilà. Parce qu'il y a des gens, il y a des gens qui sont, il y a des gens qui sont contre la voix des femmes au radio, au sein des radios. Il y a les facteurs socioculturels qui sont là. Il y a des hommes qui ne sont pas pour le fait que leurs femmes soient au sein d'une radio. Il y a des hommes qui voient ça mal. Les résultats qui peuvent y avoir, ça peut aider les femmes, ça peut aider à sensibiliser les gens, la population. Donc, ça peut amener un autre état d'esprit chez la femme. Thank you, Amber Seven. That song warms my whole heart. <laughs> it makes me so happy. Um, you're so talented. It's amazing. Um, yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> so we, we have time for a quick Q&A before we wrap up. Wow, this hour has flown by so fast. So we have a question from Eliza for you, Andy, which is, um, how did you get connected with that station and the women? How did you find the women at that station? Um, because it seems like it would be a needle in a haystack to uncover. How how I found the radio station or yeah that was I think that was the question I'm, I'm okay. paraphrasing from YouTube okay um, well I didn't find that radio station um, Radio Socorro has been a partner with WRIR since they started when WRIR started um, late um, 2000s uh, they also helped uh, uh, put a radio an independent radio station in Segu Mali and that's even before like there is an official sister cities in there. So um, when uh, Mustaf Mega came to visit uh, Richmond, he also visited um, WRIR as their kind of like their unofficial sister independent radio station here. Yeah. Okay, we have one more question. Um, Masitan says lots of people were against women's voices in the radio. Did you guys have to deal with any legal issues or resistance in Segu or in Richmond? 
Um, there were a lot of people that were, uh, what do you call it, warning us to make sure that we don't get way too political when we were in Mali. Because, uh, you know, talking about these issues over there, it's still kind of dangerous. Um, sorry, what was the question again? It was like, like, did you have any legal issues or resistance? Legal issues, not really. Um, resistance, I didn't see much resistance, but mostly it's the silence of the, the, silence of the women over there. Um, they were very hesitant to um, get interviewed on the bike. I mean, you could tell that they wanted to speak more, but they were just very hesitant for their own safety as well. Um, so that would be the resistance that we were seeing. Uh, I do remember there was this one man that was kind of against it, but he wasn't violent about it. He just like <laughs> he just said that like I don't think like women should be on the radio. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. Cool. So <laughs> just, we just like walked away. Yeah, pretty much. But yeah, nothing with permits that I can remember. But um, we'll find out. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, here's another question. What's the What's the thing that you're most proud of so far? Even though the film's not done yet, what's the thing you're most proud of that you've done? What am I the most proud of? I mean, like the fact that we've accumulated all of this footage with like really vital information about just the realities that we're all living in. And like you know, and this is probably like the biggest project that I've had to, um, I've had to help making with. And we've collaborated with like so many people. Like there's at least like I think of like 75 people that has come in and like done little things here and there to just like make this uh, documentary happen. Mm -hmm. Even like the, the little aspects, like you know, like our friends. Um, did transcript work and like each transcript work probably took them like five hours to do for like each scene mm -hmm. and the fact that we were able to like bring everybody together and um, uh, finish goals for this documentary I think that would be like the proudest thing that I could think of. I'm the most proud of you. Ah, I'm mm. proud of you too. <laughs> so we do have a really small audience here with us today. Does anyone in our small audience have a question for Andy? Because I got more. So I, I have a question. Oh, sorry. Introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Ariel Batska. I am uh, the associate producer on Thank this you so channel. Much, and, hey. Hey. and honestly, like um, these two women do the most incredible and amazing work. I can't even express to you, but I still have a million questions, even though I work with them a little bit. And, <laughs> Um, one of my questions is, in terms of, uh, you know, your work in Africa, can you talk a little bit about what your experiences were like in Mali when you traveled there, Andy? Okay. Um, <laughs> that, that was um, an interesting one. Because uh, when we went to Mali, we didn't really know what our story was yet. All we wanted to, all we were trying to, like, get is, um, have a better feel of uh, who would be our journalist to cover. And um, we were helped by a lot of people to uh, make this happen, but for the most part, like Cameron and I, like we weren't even like in connection with them. We weren't communicating with them with like the language barrier and all that. So we relied on uh, everyone around us to like, you know, make this work for us. And while we were there, um, you know, like our French was pretty terrible and everyone was speaking French. We had no idea what anyone was saying. So like as somebody who had the camera and I was just like hoping that we were getting all the footage and all the information we needed, I was just like taking B-roll of everything. Just in case, just in case like something they touched on, at least we'd have a B-roll of it. So, um, and we were there for nine days and we were shooting at least like five scenes a day. It was, uh, and there was only like really the three of us in production. I would say four if we include Erica's husband who was with us the entire time. So that's Cameron, Erica, Mamadou, and me. And, and um, uh, Amadou, who's also our driver. So there's really, there's really just like the five of us uh, trying to like, you know, gather all the scenes, um, cover, like, cover as much as uh, possible with like each location. And each location, we were only there for like maybe two hours. So, um, so yeah, it was really intense. Oh yeah, and at the evening, like we have to do backups of all of like the camera footage that we got. So um, 
this is my first experience, and I think this is our first experience of like real film production. And we were probably working like 14 hours like each day in those nine days. Like when we came back from Mali, like I was dead for two weeks. I was like brain dead for two weeks. Like that was so much work. And on top of that, like trying to like back up everything. So um, I like for me, like a lot of like my experiences there was a little hazy, but I got all the footage, you know, <laughs> so like I could just like watch all of that. So. <laughs> Uh, I do remember you made time to go see a uh, Amadou and Mariam concert that started at midnight, and I was like, no, I'm not going to that, even though I love them. Yeah. You still managed to go see a concert that started at midnight, so I thought, oh, I was really proud of you. You like were living <laughs> it up. You're like, I'm still experiencing culture. So I, I have to see Amadou and Mariam in Africa. Like, you know, where is the best place to like see them? And um, yeah, it's, um, it was an interesting experience. For those of you who don't know, Mali is kind of considered like the music nation for West Africa. They're like some of the most incredible music. They have a history of uh, basically like musicians, griots who serve a very strong, important social political purpose. As a result, there's a tremendous amount of amazing music that comes out of there. And we knew about that from the radio station, but the music and the dancing and the food and how kind everyone was was really shocking to me. But yeah, the, it's like kind of embarrassing to not understand your own documentary subject when she's speaking in French or Bamanakan. But we we're working on it. We we're much better at our French now, and Masi Khan is pretty much perfectly proficient in English. So I think we have time for one more question. Does anyone have another question? No? Well, um, Amber, would you mind coming up here with us? We're going to wrap up and call to action and just say, um, I just want to say thanks. Like your music is so beautiful and inspiring. Um, is there anything that you'd like to say to the audience who's watching? Um, first, thank you for being present, and you know, keep using our voices to inspire ourselves, inspire our loved ones in the world around us. You know, and using our voices to create love. You know, like our words, our vibrations, just speaking love into everything that we do. Yes. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. That's a beautiful message. Um, and you can speak love into our PayPal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> go to our website. It's right at the top. It's a button. Support Sister Radio and also support local artists like Amber Seven. Um, that's it. Thank you so much for coming and uh, stay tuned. Definitely check out the ICA's Community Media Center and stay tuned from us on all of our social channels. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>